Welcome to Math with Professor V. In this video, we're going to solve the following problem. Find the value of k so that f of x, which is piecewise defined as 1 minus cosine kx over x sine x if x is different from 0, or 1 half if x equals 0, is continuous at x equals 0. I was sent this question from a viewer, and it's very similar to one that I give my students as well in Calc 1, so I loved it. I wanted to solve it right away. So first, let's review what our definition of continuity is, because that's going to help us answer this question, okay? We want to find k, I'll worry about that in a minute, so that this function is continuous at x equals 0. What is our three-part definition of continuity? So we say f of x is continuous at x equals a, in this case I'll say x equals 0, if the following three conditions are true. 1. f of 0 is defined. It exists. 2. The limit as x approaches 0 of f of x exists, and it needs to be a finite number. And 3. Third condition basically encapsulates the first two, that step one is equal to step two. So the function value at zero is equal to the limit as x approaches zero of f of x. So if I look at this piecewise function here, is condition one satisfied? Is f of zero defined? Well, it's piecewise defined. And right here I can see if x is equal to zero, f of zero is one half. So let's write that down, yes. In fact, f of 0 equals 1 half. Step 2, the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x exists. It has to exist as a finite number. I don't have that limit readily available to me just yet. I'm going to need to evaluate it. So I'm going to take the limit of f of x as x approaches 0. And when we're taking the limit of a piecewise defined function, I'm not looking here at what it's actually equal to at 0. I'm looking at how the function behaves or is defined as you get close to zero. So that's this part of the function. So let's go ahead, work on step two, find this limit. And then finally in step three, I'll worry about making sure that my limit is equal to this function value of one half, okay? So what we're gonna do now is take the limit as x approaches zero of what we have up there, 1 minus cosine kx over x sine x. And this is the calculus one problem in the beginning of the semester, so we're not going to use L'Hopital's rule, okay? We have two different limit rules or formulas that we can apply, and I'll remind you what they are right now just in case you need a little refresher. We know the following. The limit as theta approaches 0 of sine theta over theta equals 1. Also, you can take the reciprocal. This is the same as the limit as theta approaches 0 of theta over sine theta. Why is that the case? Because reciprocal of 1 is still 1. So if you flip this guy, nothing changes. And then also we have one more limit formula, limit as theta goes to 0 of 1 minus cosine theta over theta equals 0. So I'm going to rely on these here to help me evaluate this limit, okay? Now, at first glance, I was tempted because of this 1 minus cosine kx to try to use this uh, limit rule, but it didn't help out. So instead, once I saw that that was futile, I decided to multiply by the conjugate conjugate of the numerator, okay? That's something common you'll do with trig functions because then you can use a Pythagorean identity. You'll see what I mean in just a second. So I'm gonna multiply by one plus cosine kx, okay? And I'll show you later why, why this whole thing didn't work out, okay? Don't worry, but let's just solve this now. So we have the limit as x approaches zero this is 1 minus cosine squared kx over x sine x times 1 plus cosine kx. 
All right, and then I told you the whole point of this conjugate business is so that we can use a Pythagorean identity. So I can replace the numerator, one minus cosine squared kx with, that's right, sine squared kx over x sine x times one plus cosine kx. How are we doing so far? Good? Okay. So now I'm going to break everybody up so that I can use these limit rules right here. Just the first two. So I have limit x approaches zero. The numerator is sine squared kx. I'm going to break them up. That's sine kx times another sine kx. Okay. And then I'm going to list one over one plus cosine kx separately. And then who's left? x sine x. I'm gonna put the x underneath one of these signs. And then I have plain old sine x over here. I know this might seem bizarre, but I've done several of these trig limit problems before and this is usually the best approach. If you're really struggling with trig limits, I'm gonna link a video right here you should watch it and I work through plenty more examples so that you'll understand this process with ease. I just wanna break everybody up term by term so that I can use these limit laws here, okay? So watch what's going on. Everybody's accounted for, right? This is sine squared, let me color code for you. Here's sine squared kx, here it is. Okay, nothing illegal is occurring. Here's x. Where's this sine x? It's right here, don't worry. And then one plus cosine kx is right here. Okay, great. Now, in order for me to use this first limit rule here, theta has to go to zero, and then the argument, sine of whatever, sine of theta has to match what's in the denominator. These have to be matchy-matchy. So I'm looking over here, I've got kx, but I only have lonely little x down here. Oh me, oh my, I wish this was kx, because then they would match, and I would have theta over theta. I could say this whole term goes to 1. So my motto is, in math, you don't sit around feeling sorry for yourself that things aren't the way you want. You make it happen. Here we are, making dreams come true. There's the k that I was hoping was there. But if I add an extra k in the denominator, I'm going to multiply by k over 1 here at the end of the expression. That way, all I did was multiply by 1, right? k over k. Good. Continue. Continue making dreams come true. Oh me, oh my, I wish there was a kx down here, don't you? Great. Put it there, but then you can't just go willy-nilly putting kx in the denominator. We need kx in the numerator right here. Great. Do we have problems with 1 plus cosine kx? No. Why do I say that? x is going to 0, cosine of a constant times 0, that's still 0, cosine of 0 is 1. So this whole term right here is going to 1 divided by 1 plus 1. That's going to 1 half. Great. So this is just going to a half. I don't need to manipulate or play with anything there. Last term to focus our attention on. Again, I want to use this limit rule here. What am I missing up top? An x, exactly. So go add it in there. I added an x in the numerator, so I need 1 over x in the denominator. All right, we're ready. We can start taking the limit of what I have here. And also notice this x cancels with the one I just added, so that'll make things a lot easier to deal with. All right. This first term here, sine this kx, this whole thing is going to 1, right? This is sine theta over theta. That's theta. That's theta. Same thing for the next term. This goes to 1. This we already know. 1 over 1 plus cosine kx goes to a half. x over sine x, that goes to 1. k is just a constant. It stays the same. And then here's 1. So what am I left with? My limit is 1 times 1 times a half times 1 times k times k times 1, which is 1 half k squared. Beautiful. There's our limit. So now I can go back to step 2 in my continuity definition, and I can say, all right, 
We did indeed find the limit. It was finite as x approaches 0 of f of x, and it is 1 half k squared. Well, step three, I need to ensure that the limit is equal to the function value. So I need to go ahead and set 1 half k squared, that's my limit, equal to 1 half in order for the function to be continuous and for condition three to be satisfied. So to bring this problem on home, we need f of zero, which is 1 half, to equal the limit as x e approaches zero of f of x, which was 1 half k squared. So 1 half has to equal 1 half k squared. That means k squared is 1. So k can be plus or minus 1. All right, both values work. The negative 1, if you look back, if we were to put it into the original function, let me rewrite the piecewise function here. It was 1 minus cosine kx over x sine x, right? If x is different from 0, and then 1 half if x is 0. If I plug in 1, this would be 1 minus cosine x over x sine x. If you plug in negative one, I don't know if you guys all remember, cosine is an even function. So by definition, cosine of negative x is equal to cosine of x. So they simplify to the same result. But both values of k are valid in terms of a solution, okay? Um, I'll show you, I promised you to, uh, Talk about why using that other limit rule didn't work, but this is the conclusion of the problem, okay? Uh, the other thing that I initially tried, if you have the limit as x approaches zero, and I was doing one minus cosine kx over x sine x, and I tried to mistakenly use limit as theta goes to zero, one minus cosine theta over theta, just because it looked so similar, right? And then you go, okay, limit x goes to 0, 1 minus cosine kx. I left that x there. Then you have this sine x here. So to make the arguments match, right, kx, theta, theta, I added a k here. So then I added a k here. And then also this sine x needs an x here. So you have times 1 over x. Now here's the problem. Are you ready for the big problem? Ooh, this is going to go to 0, this is going to go to 1, this is going to go to k, but uh-oh, 1 over 0 approaches either positive infinity or negative infinity, and since I don't know from which side, it doesn't exist. Ah, okay. And 0 times infinity, even if I could tell from which side, that's an indeterminate form. There are seven indeterminate forms. Think like the seven deadly sins. And the most common ones you're going to work with in the beginning of your calculus career, you've probably already seen 0 over 0, infinity over infinity, 0 times infinity, and infinity minus infinity. There's three additional, but you learn those later when you learn L'Hopital's rule. The reason why we call these indeterminate forms is because they don't always have a set rule for what the limit's going to be. Like for example, if you have one over infinity, that's always going to zero. That's set, that's not indeterminate. But zero over zero sometimes approaches one half, it sometimes approaches one, it sometimes goes to infinity. It cannot be determined when it is written in this format. It is indeterminate. It does not mean it doesn't exist. It means you need to do something else before you can determine that limit. Same thing for these, infinity over infinity. Zero times infinity is not zero. It means something's shrinking and something's blowing up and it's not clear which one's running the show. It changes depending on the problem. And same thing here with infinity minus infinity. They don't just cancel out, okay? Infinity plus infinity, that goes to positive infinity. Or negative infinity minus infinity, that goes to negative infinity. There's no competition. The indeterminate form means it cannot be determined when it is in this form. Further investigation is required. What does further investigation mean? 
factoring, multiplying by a conjugate, dividing by the highest power, using one of these limit rules, you gotta play with it, okay? And then later, when you learn L'Hopital's rule, um, you can apply that to evaluating indeterminate forms of the type zero over zero or infinity over infinity. But that's later. If you try to Google on the internet and you're in Calc 1 in the beginning of the semester limit problems, a lot of the times they will use L'Hopital's rule and your teacher will know that you cheated or that you referenced an online resource without trying for yourself. It's very obvious. So we know better to ask for help and actually understand the process. And when it's time to learn L'Hopital's rule, you can do so with a clean conscience. All right, end of rant. Um, if you need more help on L'Hopital's rule, limits, indeterminate forms, check out the rest of my video lectures. This was just the quickest little summary, but I loved this little problem so very much. And end of story, k equals one, k equals negative one. I would say if you're gonna write up a full solution, I would definitely include the definition of continuity because that is what the problem asked for you to ensure was that the function was continuous. Okay, that concludes the video. Give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, subscribe also. Check out the rest of my video lectures. They're organized into playlists. And you can also follow me on Instagram and TikTok and Twitter. Math with Professor V. I'll be back soon. Love you all. Bye.